again take a seat. I hope all the, the rest of the people will also flow in soon. We are coming to our final topical session um, and it is about policies and law legal aspects and these are two important aspects to be discussed of course in this context. And it is my great pleasure to introduce to you the moderator of this session, the former chairman of the UN uh, Committee for um, Peaceful Use of Outer Space, COPOS, uh, Mr. David Kendall. He, is, uh, he has been long years uh, um, a leading figure in the Canadian Space Agency and I want to mention that he has been um, a long-term supporter of the Federation um, uh, amongst other functions. He was four years our Vice President. So please welcome David Kendall. Thank you, Christian. Good, good, good. Okay, I'm sure more people will uh, come in in the next little while. Um, this is the last, uh, as uh, Christiane said, the last formal session we have uh, until we get to this afternoon's wrap-ups. Um, there's a couple of uh, thanks I'd like to uh, make on behalf of the panel. First of all, to the organizers, the International Program Committee co-chairs that have put this remarkable, I think remarkable, uh, meeting together over the past three days. So thank you to Driss El Hadani, uh, Jean-Pascal Lefranc, and of course Val Munsami for their tremendous work in, uh, in, in, in entertaining us, one might say, for the last three days. And, uh, and I, think it's, I think it's been a great success. Um, I'd, also, I'd also like to start this, uh, this panel with a little story. Um, my background is as, as a scientist. I started my career uh, as a physicist, um, and then I was uh, for many years running a space science program at the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, and early in my career, I uh, thought that uh, policy and law was just uh, a way to get in the way of the things that I thought was important, which was to deliver good science and good technology because those, if you, if you got those right, if you had the right uh, uh, excellence in those areas, um, of course they would be uh, supported, of course they would fly, of course everything would, uh, would, be, uh, would be wonderful. Um, and over my career, I, I started to realize that, uh, that no, there's another element to this. And, and it was cemented to me by uh, a, a friend and colleague of mine, John Logston, um, Back uh, some 30 years ago, i have been involved with the International Space University now for about 30 years teaching there. And John, uh, who, who for many years uh, ran the policy uh, group uh, within, uh, within ISU, um, kept on telling me, um, uh, patted me on the head and said, policy will always win over in the end. And it's taken me roughly 30 years to realize that, but uh, I, I'm now a firm believer that unless you get the policy right, uh, you, will not, uh, you will not succeed in, uh, in anything basically you do in this, in this field. What's been interesting for me specifically is that over the past three days, I think every panel has stressed in some way or another the need to deliver and get the policy right as a fundamental underpinning of, of, of what we do. Uh, we started off with Tidian Utaka, um, who gave, of course, the original uh, keynote speech a couple of days ago, who stressed the importance of developing a consistent policy for African states to develop the African Space Agency, which is uh, where he, he is, his, what he's leading right now. Adris El Hadani noted the three pillars to develop a space program, resourcing, capabilities and governance. Steve Boschinger stated the need for a long-term vision and stable funding as the underpinning of any program. And I, I want to comment that Chris Lee, I thought, made a very good comment. He stressed that not only should policy underline the space program, but you have to get the policy right with respect to other government departments. You cannot just put a space policy together and expect that to work within a governmental organization. You have to bring in a whole of government approach. And I think that was a, a very uh, interesting point of view. And, and I, I strongly, strongly believe that from my own experience. Um, 
and of course, the, the last panel, I think, uh, on, uh, on industry development and support ended up basically the whole panel talking about policy um, uh, and how to get industry, and, and, and this was underpinning that. And, and of course, don't forget that Charlie Bolt, uh, his comment was the question he always asks is why? And the why is where you gonna, why are you doing it? Who's going to benefit from it? And of course, again, that brings us right back to the, to the question of policy and the legal framework, which we're going to talk about in this, in this panel. We have a very distinguished panel uh, today. Um, and uh, one thing I, I would ask you to do is go to the I, uh, GLEC website on the, on, on the web and look at the biographies of the individual um, members. Uh, I'm not going to read those out because we would be here half an hour. Um, but the, the people that we have in this panel are quite, quite exceptional. And I am extremely pleased to say that we have an additional uh, panel member, um, Mohammed Amara, the general counsel of the UAE Space Agency, uh, was not able to make it. But we have a great uh, substitute for, um, for Mohammed, and that is Talal al Kaisi, uh, the advisor for the strategic projects of the UAE. And I'm very pleased that he can join us on the panel today to uh, provide a little um, insight into the policy development of the uh, UAE program. There's one other person here who's sitting hiding that I'd like to um, acknowledge. We've all been, I think, um, uh, amazed by the way that each panel has been described uh, by the graphics uh, by Sylvia Alba. And I'd like Sylvia to come out from a little hiding hole here and just uh, take an applause because... <laughs> I, I think it's made a tremendous difference uh, to, to be, to, to succinct, so succinctly put together the, the, the core of each of, the, each of the speakers. So thank you, uh, thank you, Sylvia. Okay, um, I'm going to, without uh, ado, uh, further ado, I'm going to introduce Ermgard Marbo, um, uh, who we're very, very happy to have uh, with us today. Um, Umgard has a, a um, remarkable uh, background in, uh, in space law. Um, she is uh, the uh, Professor of International Law and Head of National Contact Point of Space Law for the University of Vienna in Austria. That's only the sort of the top layer of a very distinguished career. And she's going to give us the, um, uh, the keynote speech uh, on some legal aspects with respect to space. Uh, and then we'll go into the panel. So, Umgard. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here with you today, and I thank the organizers for having invited me here to this panel six to share some thoughts with you on legal and policy. Il est un grand plaisir d'être avec vous ici aujourd'hui. Je remercie les organisateurs pour m'avoir invité à ce panel 6 pour partager avec vous quelques idées sur le droit et politique. It has been highlighted by several speakers during the last days that this panel 6 deals with important aspects of space activities and that awareness needs to be raised in this respect. To me, this comes a bit as a surprise because the legal and policy aspects have been on the agenda of the United Nations since the very beginning of the space age, which started with the launch of Sputnik 1 in 1957. So that I will start off with a little bit of history and background, background and history. Uh, then I will recall the United Nations treaties and principles which have been elaborated in this uh, framework and emphasize some key issues which are still highly relevant and important today and need implementation 
at the international, regional, and national levels. The United Nations, as early as in 58, 1958, only one year after the launch of Sputnik 1, or issued a resolution um, in this respect and uh, determined that outer space should be explored and exploited to the fullest extent for the benefit of mankind. Um, this resolution recognized that outer space is used for peaceful purposes only, and this was very important because military um, technology and equipment was used to launch the first uh, space objects. So there was apparently and clearly the fear of an, a further arms race in outer space between the two superpowers at the time in particular, but also on a more global scale and threatening potentially all humankind. But also today, governance is important to avoid conflict. So the peaceful use is in a perhaps a different sense to avoid conflicts between space actors. Um, for example, when it comes to the exploitation of resources. Um, so from the very beginning, it was very important uh, that there needs to be governance in the framework of the United Nations. So the United Nations General Assembly then established a committee on the peaceful uses of outer space, UN COPOS, as early as in 58, as an appropriate body for international cooperation. And it requested the UN Secretary General to render appropriate assistance. This assistance is today carried out by the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs, which has its seat in Vienna, where I, am, I come from. Um, in 1961, um, two subcommittees were created, the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee on the one hand, and the Legal Subcommittee on the other. So we see, as early as 1961, we had a legal subcommittee um, of the UN COPOS. And this legal subcommittee immediately started working on the legal framework. And it was remarkably successful and elaborated five UN United Nations treaties on outer space. The first was the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. And you see the ratifications are rather remarkable, 107 state parties and 23 further signatures. Subsequently, the Rescue and Return Agreement was elaborated and ratified until today by 96 countries and signed by 23 further uh, countries. Um, then, Liability Convention of 1972, ratified by 95 member um, states and signed by 19, um, which establishes a unique liability regime for outer space activities because of its dangerousness and its hazardous nature. So states recognize that they need a specific liability regime concentrated on states, which is unique. I can tell you in international law, there is no comparable system in any other area where there is unlimited and absolute liability of states. So we have to deal with that in the framework of legal and policy issues. Then the Registration Convention of 1975, a little less <laughs> successful, only 67, but still the most important spacefaring nations have ratified uh, the registration convention uh, as well. Only the Moon Agreement of 1979 um, had, has received only 18 ratifications and five further signatures, um, but still has entered into force in 84 and has seen several recent ratifications uh, in the last years. So this is an open debate whether the Moon Agreement is relevant or not. I can only allude uh, to the discussions of the League Subcommittee, which are currently taking place in the framework um, of the United Nations. Um, in addition to the treaties, 
there are United Nations principles on outer space, also five by coincidence. The first is um, the very first uh, declaration of legal principles preceding the Outer Space Treaty, but later the four sub subsequent resolutions focused on um, the reaction on new technological and political developments, such as direct television broadcasting, remote sensing, nuclear power sources, and international cooperation in the exploration and use of outer space for the benefit and interest of all states, taking into particular account the needs of developing countries, the so-called Benefits Declaration of 1996. So this was sort of the corpus until uh, and at the end of the 20th century. The situation changed at the beginning of the 21st century because it became clear that the United Nations should address recent developments of in, uh, in outer space uh, activities, namely privatization and commercialization. Until that time, roughly, uh, we, we have seen uh, space activities primarily carried out by states, governments, various governmental entities, agencies, defense, um, research, but not by private uh, actors and uh, for commercial purposes. So this was a trend started in the 90s, perhaps some precursors in the 80s, if you have seen the Surrey in the UK was very early in the 80s, but rather started in the 90s. So at the beginning of the 21st century, the UN reacted with three, re three General Assembly resolutions which tackled in particular uh, the issue of commercialization and privatization of space activities. First, the application of the concept of the launching state needed to be looked at more closely. Second, um, the registration of space objects also required some further thought. And third, national space legislation became increasingly important and needed. So the recommendations on national legislation relevant to the peaceful exploration and use of outer space was adopted in December 2013. This brings us to the key issues which are particularly relevant today also and which need to be borne in mind in the development of current and future space activities. First, the launching state and the liability, as I said, a unique liability, absolute and unlimited liability of the launching state. And the challenging uh, issue in this respect is that there is a definition of launching state which comes to the result that there can be up to four launching states for one single launch. This comes from the definition of the Outer Space Treaties, namely a state which launches or second procures the launch of a space object, ob object third from whose territory an object is launched or from whose facility an object is launched. So up to four launching states are um, possible for one single launch, and all of them are absolutely and unlimited uh, liable. Unli unlimited liability is um, um, uh, applicable. This is uh, this is emphasized uh, here in another. You know, that just to to, to to remind you, all launching states are liable for damage caused by the space object. The unlimited unlimited liability, however, is only valid for damage caused on Earth or on aircraft in flight. Um, a fault liability is applicable if there is a collision in outer space between two space objects. So we have a little differentiation, but still the launching a state concept is key. Liability is there. For second, registration. Space object must be registered by the launching state. As we've heard, there are up to four launching states. But only one launching state can and must register. The registration convention says there is an agreement necessary if there are more than one launching state. And this is very important for jurisdiction and control of space objects. So to say they get the nationality of a space object or the flag state of a space object, which we know from the law of the sea. We have flag states for ships. So the registration is key in this respect. Third, authorization and continuing supervision. 
states are international respon internationally responsible for national activities in outer space. That's the wording of Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty. Also, a specific, very specific regulation which we do not know in other areas of international law. Usually, a state is only responsible for its governmental organs and governmental entities, not for non-governmental entities, so this, which is the case here. Activities by non-governmental entities need authorization and continuing supervision to ensure that also non-governmental entities comply with the rules of the UN Space Treaties. So these key issues need to be implemented. They need implementation, again, on three levels. First, international level. The UN treaties are international treaties, so they are binding for states. States are directly bound by the treaties. And in case of violation, the states are international responsibility, responsible, so the consequence is full reparation and guarantees of non-repetition. The enforcement and implementation must be ensured between states, between governments, by negotiation or other forms of dispute settlement. The regional level. Uh, in, international, in the United Nations context, we talk about regions when we mean continents, largely. So continental cooperation. Um, a regional or continental cooperation usually takes place in intergovernmental organizations. For example, the European Space Agency, and more recently at the European continent, the European Union. It is remarkable that the Outer Space Treaty already mentions intergovernmental organizations in, in its text. So in the UN Space Treaty, since starting in 67, even before ESA was founded, there were some predecessors, but apparently already in the drafting process of the treaties, um, the possibility of international cooperation was envisaged and laid down as a legal, um, in a legal framework. I can quote Article 13 of the Outer Space Treaty, which says, the provisions of this treaty shall apply to the activities of state parties to the treaty, whether such activities are carried on by a single state party or jointly with other states, including cases where they are carried on within the framework of intergovernment, international intergovernmental organizations. Um, so clearly, they apply also for international cooperation and in the framework of international organizations. And the ARA, the Rescue and the Return Agreement, even goes so far as not to talk any longer from, by, uh, of the launching state, but replaces this term by launching authority to make clear there is a, can be a launching state, but it can also be a launching authority, which is an intergovernmental organization, such as ESA, for example. And as a consequence, international intergovernmental organizations may declare the acceptance of the rights and obligations of the UN Space Treaties formally and, de and deposit such instruments with um, uh, the United Nations and cle make clear that they accept these rights and obligations. And ESA has done so, UMITSAT has done so, several other uh, intergovernmental organizations have deposited such declarations. EU has just this year declared that it will consider also declaring the acceptance because since 10 years, since the Treaty of Lisbon, it has also a competence on space and is now carrying out a European space policy in its own name and, and own satellites. And so apparently it is necessary that the EU also accepts liability and registration obligation. And I add here the AU, perhaps the African Union, when it proceeds in its, with its African space policy and establishes the African space agency in the future, may also consider to um, declare the acceptance of the rights and obligations of the UN treaties, space treaties. And finally, the national level, states need to make sure that private entities, of course, governmental entities, that's self-evident, but also private entities under their jurisdiction comply with the UN space treaties and principles. And this is done by authorization and continuing supervision. And this leads us to the importance of national space law and policy, which is, uh, I would say, close to my heart. 
because I was the chair of the working group on national space legislation of the legal subcommittee between 2008 and 2012. And uh, the first step was to an agenda item in the legal subcommittee on the general exchange of information on national legislation relevant to the peaceful exploration and use of outer space. The working group um, had its mandate concluded by the report of 2012, and you find the reference here, and a report which I commend to you for reading because it contains replies from member states about their national frameworks and reasons, uh, legal and pol policy considerations. It's um, a rich source of information what other states have done and why they have or have not enacted national space law and what their national policies are. Uh, the result of the working group is also the UN General Assembly Resolution of December 2013, which I uh, mentioned earlier. And it contains um, a few recommendations to countries, to states, uh, when they consider enacting national space legislation, which has, of course, a lot to do with the definition of national space policy. So the scope of application needs to be defined. What is a space activity? What should be regulated? Then second, national jurisdiction. Uh, should it be territorial and or personal jurisdiction? So who should be regulated? Then authorization, designation of an authority. Who is competent or who should be competent for these roles? Um, the conditions and procedures should be set out clearly in the authorization process. Continuing supervision is uh, equally necessary as authorization and there could be some uh, consequences and sanctions included if, uh, the, um, proceed, if the conditions are not met. Registration, the recommendation goes that you need a double registration, namely national registry and international registration at the UN. So you have to establish a national registry and at the same time further on um, notify this registration to the United Nations. With respect to liability, there, should, there is a possibility of seeking a recourse, of thinking about can we get recourse from the operator if the state is liable and has to pay, can it get back the money from the operator? And in this connection, the need to take out insurance can be considered. Finally, the transfer of ownership or control of space objects in orbit should be considered because this is also an effect of uh, privatization, commercialization, that space objects are um, uh, bought and sold in orbit. And so also the, the legal um, uh, situation changes and this should also be foreseen in national space law. With this, I thank you very much for your attention. I hope I have highlighted key issues which have to be considered in legal and policy issues with respect to space activities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jerem Gard. Um, could I ask the, uh, the panel members, please, to, uh, to join us on stage? And we'll start the, uh, the panel. Thank you. Excellent, everybody's here. Um, so let us uh, right away get, uh, get on uh, moving. Um, the first uh, panelist uh, is uh, Mohamed Khalil Ibrahim, who is a professor at the School of Aerospace and Automotive Engineering uh, here in Morocco at Rabat International University. So Mohamed, uh, sorry, Khalil, I think you prefer to call Khalil. So. Thank you, Dave, for your uh, kind introduction. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizer of this uh, great event. And uh, well, I will, I will try to go over the, 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 the Moroccan effort uh, regarding the uh, space law and policy. And uh, I would like to highlight also the efforts that we uh, are doing at the International University of Rabat. So well, uh, Morocco is the one of the uh, active nation in Africa 
and uh, as emerging country uh, is building up its space policy as early as late 1980 and uh, is microphone we have the other, other microphone here, the hand, or the hand microphone, here. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. I don't hear. No, not Thank you. So, uh, it's all, uh, Morocco is a member of the COBOS uh, since uh, 1961 and uh, is actively uh, take part of the proceeding of the subcommittees since 1992 and uh, has ratified the five UN treaties uh, as was presented. Uh, and one of the two United Nations uh, affiliated regional center for space science and technology are uh, located in uh, Morocco in Rebat. The other one is located in uh, Nigeria. And uh, the uh, uh, space law uh, is being taught in the uh, Rebat uh, center, uh, the, and as well as other technical, uh, and it's offer also uh, three uh, master degrees in uh, remote sensing, satellite uh, navigations, and meteorology. There's more than 300 participants uh, already trained in the center, and the center also organized workshop and symposiums about space law for the uh, French-speaking uh, African countries. Uh, Morocco is currently uh, in the process of setting up its uh, national uh, space law. So, uh, as we know that uh, with, the, uh, with the advancement of technology, uh, many countries are now seeking uh, to have their own space assets, uh, which is basically it's micro satellite or miniature uh, small sets. And uh, this is uh, um, highlighted the uh, and addressed the issue of space sustainability and uh, uh, in an effort uh, uh, to do uh, or to contribute to the uh, improving the awareness of space uh, sustainability uh, as we uh, already uh, listened to the uh, panel discussion about infrastructure uh, Mrs. Uh, Reika Washima the uh, UNICEF Global uh, Secretary General uh, mentioned in her talk that is uh, IAA and the UNICEF uh, uh, Global uh, wrote a book uh, which is titled The Post uh, Mission Disposable, uh, Disposal Techniques for Small Sets, which is uh, a technical guidebook and uh, I think it will be of great importance for the emerging countries building their own satellites or seeking to have their own satellites. Uh, at the International University of Rebat, uh, uh, we have uh, aerospace engineering program uh, which was launched in 2011 and uh, this uh, is the only aerospace engineering program uh, in Morocco, which uh, uh, is in English. And uh, in this program, we are graduating roughly uh, every year around uh, between 40 to 50 students. We are focused mainly on uh, aeronautical sciences as well as uh, astronautical science. And there is a discipline dedicated for space engineering where the students are uh, learn how to uh, do the mission analysis and design, as well as the, uh, design the subsystem of the satellites. Recently, 
we uh, revised the program so that we integrated uh, SS space law in some of the courses of the program that highlight the, uh, the importance of the space law and the space policy for the uh, nations. Uh, and we, uh, the things that like the uh, space sustainability, the frequency coordinations, and the third party uh, liability as well as the uh, United Nations uh, registrations who, uh, who are highlighted and integrated in some of the courses which we are offering at the International uh, University of Repat. So Morocco as an emerging country is making significant efforts to improve its educational uh, system and promote scientific career among the youth. And I am sure that Morocco will play a pivotal role uh, in space activity uh, in Africa in the coming year. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Khalil, for that overview of what's happening here in Morocco um, as an emerging space program. Um, I just want to mention, I should have done before, that I'm very pleased to see a 3G panel here. Uh, we have uh, gender, we have geography, and I think we have generational... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you, uh, thank you again to the panel. Um, the next speaker is uh, Marta uh, Gagarol, who's the chief counsel for the Centro de Investigation y Diffusion Aeronautico Espacial. Sorry for my very poor Spanish. Uh, from uh, from Uruguay. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kenden. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that I'm very pleased to share this panel with so distinguished experts. Um, I would uh, refer uh, mainly to the international cooperation, space cooperation, and its importance uh, for developing countries, considering in particular the situation of Latin America. Uh, <clears throat> we consider that we should consider that space science and technology have a fundamental difference with other areas of knowledge. They are basically global. They are, have an international dimension and scope and tend to universality. Developing countries, most of which haven't developed space technology, have always searched to achieve the benefits provided by this technology. The international space regulations that were created since the beginning of the space age established that the exploration and exploitation of space should be conducted for the benefit of developing countries. Space treaties and principles adopted by the UN General Assembly sought to reduce existing asymmetries. Let's agree that space law has become an important aspect of the existence of our planet because it regulates a number of activities that are part of our everyday life. The fact is that concerning space issues, there is a great disparity between different countries, both from the technological and from the legal point of view. Situations range from countries that have achieved a full space development, have their own space agency, have ratified all the space treaties, and have established its space policy and its national space programs. Two, at the other hand, at the other end, those countries that have not reached any of these phases. Between both cases, there are intermediate situations. And uh, referring to space law, international cooperation is space law's golden rule. It is a very a key aspect in many space programs. It is a visible uh, alternative for developing countries, enabling them to enjoy the benefits given by, by space applications. The question is how to take advantage of this favorable legal framework in order to increase 
the participation of the developing countries in regional or international space projects. The issue has been present in the UN since its founding in 1945. The UN has worked intensely in application programs of science and technology for the benefit of the less developed regions. All space treaties include the principle of international space cooperation, but there are two essential documents, the Outer Space Treaty and the Benefits Declaration. Scientific and technological activities cannot develop without legal rules and must preserve one of the main space law characters, predictability. The law is the most important tool that developing countries have in order to ensure that space activities would serve the interests of all states and of humanity as a whole. Referring to Latin America, funding for the development and expansion of many sectors is limited due to budget constraints or governmental priorities. Space programs are not always first on the list. But it should be noted that there are diverse realities among the countries in this region. There are countries which have achieved an important development since long time ago. They have evolved and some have their own launch platforms and have already launched satellites manufactured by themselves. On the contrary, others even don't have a working plan in this area, which means that the gap between the Latin American countries is very large. However, in recent years, more countries have achieved space progress, developing more and better technology, implementing new plans, and creating new space agencies. An example of this is Paraguay, that established its space agency in 2014, and this year approved Paraguay's space policy. What has not yet be, been achieved in, in here in Latin America is a regional cooperation which includes all the countries of the Latin American area, as it has, ha has happened in Asia, Africa, and Europe. With regard <coughs> to the latter, issue, uh, it should be noted that in recent years the idea of creating a Latin America space agency appeared again, an idea that was presented long time ago by the delegation of Chile in Unispace 82. As a conclusion, I would say that it is important to strengthen space cooperation in the world in general and in Lat Latin America in particular. Despite several agreements have been concluded between nations in the region throughout the years, there still remains to be identified a common space policy for the whole region. Any multilateral initiative to address this issue would represent an important form of regional, regionalism with reasonable potential for success. In general, Latin American treaty nations are in urgent need for space technology and data in order to achieve their sustainable development. What is fun fundamental is the existence of a common political direction in order to identify and elaborate a regional space policy with clear strategies and goals for the benefit of every Latin American nation. As soon as that endeavor is concluded, the creation of a regional space agency may naturally follow. It is important so to join forces in order to be stronger. That's all, thank you. Uh, thank you, Marta, for this Im important uh, uh, contribution. And uh, I can certainly attest to the fact that um, Copius continues to struggle after 60 years to um, generate uh, policies and frameworks that uh, benefit all humanity, uh, as, you, as you have quite rightly pointed out, and, uh, and the uh, Latin American states uh, under Grulak, uh, who are, I think, very, uh, in my opinion, uh, very influential in some of the discussions, still are 
um, somewhere behind where we, we need to be. So I really appreciate your, your comments. Um, we now uh, move on to Jean-Jacques Tortora, uh, who is the director of the European Space Policy Institute uh, in Austria, and will give us uh, a more of a European uh, flavor, I think, to this issue. Yeah, thank you, David. Ah, je voudrais tout d'abord euh, dire quelques mots pour euh, remercier les organisateurs d'avoir pris l'initiative de cette conférence et de, de m'avoir fait l'honneur de m'inviter à dire quelques mots au nom de, de, de l'Institut européen de politique spatiale que je, que je dirige. Uh, now I will shift to English, uh, and it was um, it was my, my initial intention to make the promotion of the concept of regional space agency, or of the notion of a regional uh, or of space faring region, which are typically two uh, two things that uh, Europe has invented and uh, and has implemented through the setting up of the European Space uh, Agency, and I was very happy to hear all the the comments that were made uh, here uh, in, the, in the previous sessions and the statements that, that were made by uh, the, 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 the uh, African Union uh, to, uh, to, uh, to take up uh, the challenge of coming up with uh, an African uh, space agency. And I really look forward to, uh, to being given someday a counterpart uh, here in Africa uh, through the, the setting up of an African Space Policy Institute. ASP is something which sounds, uh, sounds great to my ears. So, of course, this, uh, the mo this model is, is relevant, despite all, all what was said uh, before me. I would certainly not try to, uh, to, uh, to uh, minimize the importance of, of the re national approach to space. But the, uh, as uh, Emgard rightly put it uh, before me, the regional uh, dimension is also of, of high relevance. And one of the drivers uh, behind the creation of the European Space Agency was definitely the pool of resources so and also beyond that the fact that uh, the, the although the, 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 the national uh, dimension is of high relevance it might not be the most relevant in uh, in in all the the various developments of, uh, of space uh, activities and um, and pulling resources is certainly a good alternative to avoid the multiplication of individual initiatives or of, of individual investments. That might not be the most efficient approach. Definitely the European Space Agency has been instrumental in uh, positioning Europe on the global space uh, arena. And, uh, and, and ESA has been the instrument which uh, has um, really given shape to a highly capable and competitive industry. And this is obviously the first and probably the most critical step uh, to achieve. And, uh, and certainly there are a lot of lessons to be learned from the ESA experience or ESA expertise and uh, precisely regarding the industrial and procurement policies, which are two of the major building blocks of, of the agency. And um, certainly, in many respects, the, the most difficult, not to say painful, issues to, uh, to address. And definitely reflecting on uh, what kind of uh, procurement and industrial policy uh, could uh, could be uh, the, the say could be implemented through a, a regional space agency is pr probably one of the first reflections to uh, to initiate. And uh, but if a, a skilled agency is uh, is um, I would say. Uh, essential to conceive, to uh, conduct, and to manage space programs, there is more at stake than just programs. And beyond the program, space uh, has uh, many political implications. I will not uh, recount them here. And, uh, and it's, it is clear, it is true, that Europe at a later stage also felt the need to um, invite the European Union to play an active role in the sector in order to deal with, uh, with this political dimension. So I will not enter into, into these details. I will just uh, even recommend to, to keep that for the long-term perspective. Uh, but uh, definitely this, uh, this uh, must uh, be also present in the, in the, in the I would say, in the mind uh, of, uh, of uh, or in, in the perspective of the creation of a regional space agency. 
Um, last thing, uh, last point I would like to make, uh, I'm not a, a lawyer and I will never pretend I am, but uh, definitely I would like to, to, to touch a bit on the, on the legal side of it since this, this is also the, the, the topic of this panel. Uh, because what is important is, uh, is to ensure consi consistency uh, among the various uh, national space law to be, uh, to be implemented and developed. So I will not uh, repeat what uh, all, the, all the, the, the good recommendations are uh, just gave to, 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 to you. It is clear that uh, individually all uh, nations are now have to, uh, to come up with a, a national uh, space uh, law uh, and, uh, and in particular to translate into their uh, national legislation the recommendations and uh, the principles of the, the space treaties. And this comes along with a great deal of interpretation. And, and this is not a, a detail. And, and what is important if we consider collaboration, cooperation as the, 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 the main driver, it is important to make sure that the, the countries that are likely to cooperate or to, to collaborate have a common understanding of, of the texts of, of these treaties. And uh, probably uh, regional working groups for I would say working on this interpretation of this legal text might be a good idea, and even a good idea at European level, <laughs> by, by the way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jean-Jacques, uh, for also uh, bringing up some, uh, some interesting questions that I hope that you will ask uh, questions. Um, I see there are a few questions now that are being developed. Uh, I hope we are stimulating you to, uh, uh, to think of some questions. Please use the tool that we have uh, available to us to, uh, to uh, ask the panel. We'll, we'll get to those questions uh, at the end, but uh, I, think it's, uh, uh, I think there are some, some very interesting questions uh, coming up, and especially with respect to Jean-Jacques' last uh, comment on how do we um, harmonize, one might say, national space uh, laws uh, of course, we all know that we're going through a, uh, an interesting period right now uh, and with respect to uh, that question and how are, we going to, uh, how are we going to square the circle, as we say in English. So, uh, good. Um, next uh, panelist is Magda Coco, uh, who is a partner in the space group of Vieira de Almeida in, in Portugal. Uh, Magda works um, in, uh, in the space, uh, space, legal space uh, area. Uh, with uh, a lot of um, understanding of some of the issues that are going on in Africa. So we're very happy to have Magda as part of the panel. Thank you, David. So today uh, I would like to share with you a bit of my experience uh, in working with uh, emerging countries, mainly in Africa, but also my experience in Portugal, as, as Portugal has last year approved uh, a national policy set up our own uh, national agency and we also approve uh, a legislation and actually we have now an international uh, public tender for the construction and operation of a spaceport so Portugal is also striving to have its position in in the space uh, arena so uh, when I was preparing this I thought which is the biggest challenge we face when we are designing space policies in emerging countries and also in countries like Portugal. And, and, and I think that the most challenging issue is awareness. Uh, you need, when you are designing a space policy with a country, or if you are an emerging country and if you want to design your own policy and your own strategy, you need to understand, and this is key, what is the level of awareness that the, the, the government and the, stake, the relevant stakeholders in the country have in relation to space. We need to understand if they are aware of the benefits that space activities can bring to the country, how can space contribute to the development of the country, to the goals, to the, their sectoral, national goals, and also if they have an adequate understanding of the space ecosystem at the regional and also and mainly at an international level. 
When we start working with, with, with emerging countries, we, we understand that they don't have the knowledge. Uh, and this is key because you can implement a wonderful strategy and policy, but if you don't provide the, the people that are to deal with the strategy in the future, with the know-how, with the information that they need to manage the policy afterwards, it will be a wonderful document, but no one will implement. So this is a, a key issue. Uh, and, and, and you know also need to understand uh, what are the main objectives of the country. Sometimes we start speaking about space, the space benefits, but we don't uh, take the time to, to try to understand in a very detailed way what, is the ma what are the main objectives in, in the country in relation to space. Do they want to to use the this, this space uh, uh, activities and service that already exists for the benefits of the country. I can give the example. I've, we have been working in, in two completely different African countries. One of them wanted to use space uh, for the international prestige, to, to, to have engineers uh, and, and to, to assure that the territory was covered uh, with uh, telecommunication coverage. And there was this other country that was aiming only to understand how can the country benefit from the space resources, uh, remote sensing, uh, space data, whatever. So uh, th these were completely different perspectives. And it's important that we understand what is the position and what is adequate for that country. And if they do want, if it's a country that want to invest in space and have a role in the space arena, then it is important to help the country identifying how can they differentiate from, from the rest of the countries. And this is, of course, also a very important issue. And this differentiation can be done through uh, the, the type of, of services that the country will provide, the type of investment, but also through the law. And we were talking about how important is the law to comply and to reflect the UN principles, but also the law can be a mechanism to incentivize space activities in the country. And when we draft the Portuguese law, we took that in consideration. So we, we incorporated in the law several advantage, or what we think can be advantage, for a company to establish their activities in, in Portugal. For instance, in the type of licensing, we have created blanket license for launching of, of constellation of satellites. We have included some liability caps in the benefits of the operators and so on. Other examples can be, can be shared, but the law can also be a mechanism to, to provide this, this uh, advantage to a specific country. Of course, we need to, to comply with the, with the UN treaties and so on. And, and, and finally, I would highlight that in terms of awareness, uh, you need to make sure that you involve all governmental entities in drafting a space policy. In several workshops we organized with countries, we came to the conclusion that two governmental entities were buying a space service, exactly the same ser space service to, to different entities. And this was lack of coordination. They were not aware that both governmental entities were buying this type of services. Uh, a final note, to just to say that in, in terms of awareness, you cannot forget the population. Because even, even in Europe, sometimes it's difficult to explain investment on space-related activities. But in emerging countries, this is a huge problem because population don't have access to basic needs and they do not understand how the, the, the governments are investing in space. So you cannot forget this as a key issue for, for having the support in public uh, terms. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. Um, very important words for somebody who is at the, one might say, at the uh, cutting edge of uh, working with countries of, in developing, emerging space countries, developing their own policies. Uh, so thank you. Um, we now move to Hero um, uh, Becara, who is the director of the Socio-Legal Research Center at the Universitat Catolica de Colombia in Colombia, who's uh, going to, I I think uh, support some of the uh, words of Marta in uh, the Latin American uh, um, uh, situation. So please, yeah. Thank you, David. Uh, okay, I'll start w with one question. Do you need 
National Space uh, Legislation. The country needs national space legislation before or after beginning a space program. We believe that uh, national space uh, legislation uh, it's an instrument. It can be a way to show the benefits of the space sector to the society. It can be a, a way to present to the policymakers the space benefits. When they, the society and the policymakers, really don't understand the sector. Why? We found it that in many emerging countries, for example, Panama, Salvador, and Colombia, of course, mm, the policymakers don't support the creation of the National Space Program because they believe that it's similar, yeah, or a space uh, sector or a space developed is part only of the science sector. They don't see the connection between the space sector and, for example, ICT sector, that is so important and everyone knows uh, the relevant. To try to solve uh, this problem, we realize that the policymakers, the government, has its own language. This language is the law. Then, if you start, if you want beginning a start a, a program, a space program in your country, or try to develop a space policy into your country, maybe start or try to found support to present a national space act. No in details, only a legal framework. Uh, for example, base it on the other space treaty the principle of outer space. You can take uh, a few. You don't need all the space principles. Because after that, you will be, a speak, you will be speaking sorry, your language, the politician language. And it's so important. This language means, first, the language of the society benefits, and the second, why not say it, the political benefits, and all change. Colombia is a good example. Um, Colombia, since 2006, created the Colombia Space Commission, tried to develop a national space policy, tried to develop an, a, a space program, Mm, but any of the past two government really understand the amazing benefits of the space sector and the relationship that exists with ICT sector. While in 10 years, while in 10 years, a strong ICT sector was developed in Colombia, the space sector has only two companies and one amazing foundation, but we don't have a public space research center. We don't have any public significant development in, in, in space. We believe if we can present and approve a general national space act in Colombia, this law give us the base for the second step, an organic act, it's mean a particular law about the space. And of course, look for a budget. Finally, as a part of this effort, this year we organized the first Latin American test round moot court in collaboration with the International Institute of the Space Law. Uh, four Latin American teams will be in Bogota in one month one from Paraguay, one from Venezuela, and two from Colombia. 
In this way, we join the already existing round of North America, Europe, Asia Pacific, and Africa to show the space law uh, to the world. We will invite Colombian politicians to show them, through the law, the importance of the space. And we hope uh, find support to present a general uh, space act in Colombia. We will try to speak in the government language. It's our uh, strategy right now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hero. A very interesting, what I would call a chicken and egg situation. Uh, do we have the national legislation in order to prompt the government, or do we, the government need, anyway, which is actually a, a polling question. I'm sure it's uh, being shown on the screen there. Uh, does a country need to have national space legislation before developing space activities? So far, we have a slight lead for the horse, which says no. So uh, please continue to, uh, uh, to uh, um, uh, cast your votes on that poll. Um, next is uh, Tanya Masson Swan, the assistant, an assistant professor and deputy director of the International Institute of Air and Space Law at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Uh, Tanya. Thank you, David. And uh, thank you to the organizers for putting up this very uh, important conference. Um, and I think I would like to highlight, uh, besides all the important points uh, already mentioned by my, uh, my colleagues here, uh, that we are really living in an exciting time. We're living in a time of change for the space field. And uh, so much has happened since uh, the early days, since Sputnik 1 went up 1957, and are happening. And uh, we have new actors, we have new activities, but we also have new concerns. And uh, we need to address those at the international and regional and national level. Uh, in terms of actors, of course, in the beginning it was the two superpowers uh, who, who carried out activities which mainly consisted of launching stuff up into outer space to show that they were the first, or to put man on the moon. Um, nowadays we have many more states. The, the COPOS members in the early days was 24 and now it's 93, what was it? 93, uh, coming to 100, who have to work by consensus to, uh, to agree on, uh, on uh, legal, legal principles. So the rules that were adopted uh, in the first days, uh, in the early days, uh, the, the emerging states were not necessarily a part of that consensus building. Uh, now we have uh, new states, new emerging states, but also uh, emerging space powers, but also uh, private companies, universities, who all are uh, uh, establishing activities in outer space, and that complicates the playing field. Uh, new activities also, think of uh, the, the, the commercial use of space resources, uh, suborbital flights, uh, on-orbit surfacing, active debris removal, uh, constellations of hundreds if not thousands of satellites. Just now we heard about Condosats, I had not heard about that before. Uh, cross-boundary space activities. It's no longer just the Soviet Union or the United States carrying out an activity. It can be a company in one country that builds a satellite for a company in another country and a launch provider in another country will uh, launch the satellite and then it can be sold on orbit to a new, uh, to a new entity. So there are so many more states uh, that are involved and actors that are involved. And some of those new activities uh, are exciting and are positive, but some may also be uh, a cause for concern uh, when you have a company that wants to build uh, a constellation of satellites that uh, project the logo of uh, KFC or Coca-Cola or that want to uh, send ashes of your uh, pet into outer space. I wonder if that is uh, a peaceful and useful use of outer space. So there is a need for, uh, for rules and for coordination and for uh, cooperation to, uh, to define those. Uh, new concerns also are uh, high on the agenda. We have uh, uh, an increased tension in the, in the space community with uh, the risk of weaponization, uh, anti-satellite tests, uh, the risk of cyber uh, security and uh, harmful interference with satellite signals which are uh, the order of the day and which clearly need, um, uh, need rules like space traffic management, long-term sustainability rules, uh, debris mitigation uh, rules. And it is important, I think, that all 
all states of the community are uh, a part of that debate. Um, and therefore, I think it is important that emerging countries do uh, take their seat at the table, do take part in the discussions in the United Nations, do ratify the international treaties so that they have that seat around the table and can uh, participate in those, uh, in those debates. You belong to the group. Um, I also think that it is important to stress the relevance of capacity building in that sense. And there is clearly a need, there's a lot of ambition in the emerging countries. Uh, and I think that uh, the country, our host country uh, these days is, is a very good example, uh, having ratified all the treaties, hosting one of the UN regional centers, uh, and also offering space law as a module. As you may know, uh, the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs developed a module for space law teaching for these centers. Uh, and uh, I, Rabat is the only one that I know that is actually implementing that. Also hearing that technical universities offer space law teaching as part of their curriculum, I think that is also very, uh, very uh, hopeful, very essential. Uh, you mentioned the, the moot court, and uh, I think that is uh, uh, also a very good ac activity of capacity building. Uh, let me mention the example of Africa again. Uh, in 2011, we had uh, 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 an introductory round of the African uh, moot court competition. And since 2012, every year we have had a regional round in Africa involving uh, a number of universities from a number of countries. And last year that culminated in Africa becoming the world champion uh, of all these four regions. So just in, in six, seven years, you see how much uh, capacity you can build by inspiring young people, by telling them you can plead in front of real judges of the International Court of Justice, and, and that motivates these people. They will then become the coaches of new teams. They will uh, be uh, mentors to their, to their successors. Um, at the, as far as the, the relevance of international law, uh, of national legislation is concerned, uh, it is of course always a translation of your policy. And that I think also affects the question whether you should have national law before you have a program. Having a law can attract business. Having a law can provide transparency, can provide a legal framework, can provide uh, clarity and, uh, and, and therefore can create a, a new industry in your country. So I do think if your policy is to uh, encourage space activity and to have uh, a benefit of that innovation, it definitely makes sense to have a law even before you have a space program. Uh, and in, in the region where we are currently, there are not so many. I was, uh, of course, aware of the South African law and uh, happy to hear that it's being revised. I think there is some uh, law also in Nigeria, and I was very happy to learn also that Morocco is currently uh, working on that. In Latin America, there are also uh, certain uh, initiatives. But think also about the implementation of your national law. I'm also from a small country that has had a law uh, for 10 years and uh, you do not necessarily have the capacity to uh, assess the license request that you're going to get from companies that have uh, ambitious space programs and plans. So you need also to think about how am I going to assess whether I as a government am willing to accept uh, the potential risk that the activity that these companies want to carry out uh, might pose. So I think that is also an important uh, question to, uh, to underline. And uh, in terms of, uh, lastly, of, of regional cooperation, and especially for emerging countries and smaller countries, I think that exchanging your experiences and uh, uh, lessons learned and having this kind of meetings or even consultative meetings at, uh, at ministry level uh, or exchanges of students even uh, can really help to learn from each other. And uh, I would certainly support uh, setting up an, uh, an African uh, Space Policy Institute, but why not also an African Center for Space Law on the model of uh, the European Center for Space Law. So I think there's a lot of work to be done and uh, I'll leave it uh, at that. Thank you, David. Thank you, Tania, for bringing up some uh, very interesting issues, questions. Um, again, I hope that these are stimulating you to uh, ask some, uh, ask some uh, questions of your own uh, as we uh, come towards the end of this panel. Um, I would like to mention as moderator uh, one point here. You mentioned some of the issues, the, the tensions that, uh, that uh, are, going, uh, are currently in, the, uh, in play because of, of, of the new activities and new concerns. 
Um, nobody has mentioned, and I will mention the fact that uh, Copius, although Copius is a very slowly moving body, um, uh, trying to get consensus out of uh, 90 states is, uh, is not an easy task. Um, but last year, there was, uh, I think, a remarkable success of Copius that has not very, been very well, um, I would say, articulated. And that is that uh, the, uh, the, the states uh, uh, came together to agree on 21 new guidelines on sustainability. Um, these have not passed through yet to the General Assembly because of uh, a certain hiccup, but uh, you can find these on the website. And uh, these are best practices that, that nations should now start to consider as they deliver and develop their, um, their own national legislation on space. So I'll leave it at that, but uh, if anybody wants to ask me any more questions, I'd be more than happy to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, elaborate a little. Last but certainly not least, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Mohammed uh, uh, Amara could not make it, but we are very delighted to have Talal al Kaysi, um, the advisor of the strategic projects of the UAE Space Agency with us to uh, describe a little of uh, UAE's uh, situation, which is, of course, as we know and have heard from other speakers, um, a, a new uh, uh, emerging nation in space, um, I, th I would say more than an emerging now, um, a very successful na nation in space, and you have developed your uh, policy and, and legal framework very rapidly, so we're, we're interested to know so how, how you did it. So Great, <laughs> thank you so much. And um, you know, maybe I can start by managing the expectation of the crowd, because I'm not the uh, expert at the agency, as you mentioned, uh, Hamad Amara, who uh, is, and our policy shop, who we have there, are a lot smarter than I am in policy regulations and uh, uh, law. Um, but I'm, I'm going to talk to you maybe a little bit about um, uh, my experience as a beneficiary of good policies, regulations, and laws. Uh, in, in my role in particular, I think uh, what we have established in the policy and, and, and law is an enabler to how we can attract companies and investments and, and try to build the space ecosystem in the country. So um, I think um, what's important to realize is that, number one, we're a very small and young agency. but it, in, in, in the context of this audience, it, it, it's an example of what can be done in a short period of time if you benchmark and baseline with the um, uh, subject matter experts and the experiences of others and the lessons learned others have had in taking this, uh, this uh, charting this course and this path uh, elsewhere. So for us, that, that's the first thing we did. I mean, to some of the panelists who mentioned what comes first, the, the laws or the program, I think in our case, we had no choice. Our leadership was, was determined, um, which is a good thing, obviously. There's political capital, political will to go forward with um, space as a sector that we wanted to pursue for a variety of different reasons. And, and that determination is, is what established effectively the uh, space agency in 2014 and, and kind of simultaneous to that announced a Mars mission and shortly thereafter announced a human spaceflight program. So we felt in the agency as if we were playing catch up. In, in trying to ensure that we were conforming with international obligations we had. So we had to really scramble, but at the same time do it in a very calculated and methodical way, try to understand better how others have done it, what's worked in certain places, what might have seemed like um, it, what, what could have been presumptuously over-regulation, which curtailed innovation, and, and avoid that aspect so that we can continue to conform with international obligations, but move at a pace that our leadership expected of us. So uh, I'm, I'm very proud to say that um, as, as a country, we today are the, uh, we have the first uh, law of, of its kind in the region, uh, national space law that was recently approved, a strategy and a policy as well. We're um, finalizing regulation and licensing aspects uh, at the moment. Um, our law is very comprehensive and it's also very forward looking. So if, if you know, we, 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 we try to make, we try to design our law to be the law and, and uh, a policy of the future to where we were anticipating some of the things that we foresee might be uh, taking place down the line with uh, space mining and suborbital tourism and ensure that we included those in the law from today. Because uh, that was a very important aspect to us as well. Um, I'm, I'm also glad to say that it's in line with all international agreements, and we are, uh, you know, um, uh, signatories to the Outer Space Treaty, Liability Convention, Registration uh, Convention, and Rescue uh, Agreement. Uh, and we're active members as well at Copius, uh, IS, uh, ECG, GEO, the Charter, IP, uh, IPDA, IEF, and many more organizations too. 
Um, but again, just going back on one thing that I mentioned as a beneficiary of this, I think the enablement aspect is what's most important to us. We, we don't have a law and, a reg and regulations and policies for the sake of having those things just so that we could put them on a shelf and, and, and not really activate them in any meaningful way. We have them there to facilitate the enablement of the sector as a whole and our contribution on a global scale to um, the, the global space effort, exploration efforts uh, in, in, their, in its entirety. So that's mainly what we uh, try to focus on in, in, uh, in the design of our um, uh, law strategy and uh, policy. Thank you very much, Daniel. I'm, uh, it's very interesting what you say. I mean, you have a, uh, I would say, enlightened top-down um, process, uh, and uh, you've also used uh, the experience of others. You've you've reached out and uh, said what's worked, what hasn't worked, and there's a lot of a lot of examples and a lot of, uh, uh, of assistance out there for those countries that that wish to start this process. Um, and they're not. It's not an isolation here. Uh, many countries are very willing to uh, to reach out and to uh, to help as as they can, um, and uh, and I, I note from my experience in Copius, yes, you have been a, a very active and positive uh, contributor to Copius. So uh, so it's been a it's been a pleasure working with the UAE. So thank you. Okay, so we have probably about ten minutes left uh, for some questions. Um, I see a number of you have uh, put questions down. Thank you for uh, giving us uh, some questions here. Um, so um, uh, the top one right now um, with the thumbs up is uh, are spatial policies even, uh, um, <laughs> are spatial policies even exist in emerging countries? Um, I'm not sure quite what that is. Uh, spatial policies, do, spotters, do spatial policies exist in emerging countries? Is maybe, that, that, maybe that's the question, is that the question? Okay, let's, let's ask that question then. Do spatial policies exist in emerging uh, countries? Um, Marta, do you have a, an answer to that perhaps as a... As a <laughs> Well, it, it, it depends. It depends of the country. In my country, yeah. Uruguay, we don't have a space yeah. policy. We don't have a space agency. Although we have uh, ratified all space treaties, we are a member of COPOS, and uh, we have the CDI, the, the studies, and, uh, but uh, not a special uh, space uh, policy. Not, not yet. <laughs> uh, okay, mm, it's, it's the same question, uh, answer. Mm, it depends. Uh, for example, Colombia. Colombia has a, actually has a, a, a space policy. Uh, small, very simple space policy, but Colombia has a space policy, no? Tanya said the most important is how you can develop this space policy. If you, if you don't have the, the instruments, it's, it's so difficult. And it's uh, a white paper, uh, no? Thank you. Um, well, let's move on quickly to the next one from Tobias, um, and who asks, who should develop and enforce both develop and enforce the space legal framework in a country. Mm. Magda, <laughs> put you on the spot. Yeah, uh, th that's a, a challenging question. Uh, most of the countries uh, in Europe have uh, that. Um, well, <sighs> if you are, uh, most of the countries in Europe have that uh, responsibility at a governmental level. And, but some of the countries have also at an authority level. In Portugal, we, have that we had that discussion very recently, and we came up with the telecommunication authority uh, uh, as the, the space authority on a temporary base. And this is because Portugal doesn't have yet 
a, a, a very active activity in space. But if we do have, and the spaceport project goes ahead, I think that countries should have an independent authority to manage uh, uh, the space f legal framework and be the, the authority. And this authority, in my view, that's my opinion, and this authority should be a different one from the agency. I see the agency as a promoter, and this is the case in Portugal. We have an agency as a promoter of space activities and to incentivize the industry and the investments in the country. And we have a, 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 an authority that uh, uh, enforces the legal framework, which is currently our telecommunication uh, regulator. But if in the future we have a, 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 a significant space activity, I think we should have an autonomous entity to deal with this, with the adequate knowledge and capacities to address in a rapid way the licensing and all the aspects uh, surrounding the, the legal space, uh, uh, legal framework. Yes, uh, perhaps we, uh, during the work in the um, exchange of views in the subcommittee on national systems of authorization, um, I have seen that, um, so, so a little uh, uh, for me now a word of, of, of caution, you know, not to overdo it, not to increase too much bureaucracy. If you have an autonomous agency, you know, to, to, to authorize, and so perhaps it's not necessary in particular if we look at the United States, which has a significant uh, space program and has not really one authority, but it uses for the launches the FAA and for uh, tel uh, Earth observation and NOAA, so it has different, and telecommunication, uh, another entity to, to take up the already existing expertise. Um, so if the even not the United States now perhaps reconsiders whether it would be necessary to have uh, in the future a dedicated space, uh, one space authority, it's in the process. But so far they have used what is there. And also um, sort of starting off with the telecommunication agencies is a good idea. We have done it also in Austria. The same ministry which is responsible for tel ITU uh, filings and so on has some capacity already dealing with space activities and space related activities. So um, a little word of caution, not to 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 in, to do much uh, to introduce too much uh, bureaucracy or administrative um, institutions. This, this this would be counterproductive, perhaps a bit. <laughs> Let me just add something. I, I agree with you. I forgot to mention that one key issue that we set in the Portuguese law, it's a one-stop shop procedure. So in fact, when we are doing launches, you need to articulate several entities. And in the law, there is a, a one-stop shop procedure to, to avoid bureaucracy uh, in the country. OK, thank you very much. Um, I, I think we still have a little bit of time, so I'm trying to get another one in here. Um, and I'm going to ask Tanya to respond to the question, can an umbrella law help agencies develop their policies? So I think they're asking, is a, is a one sort of over, overarching legal framework, um, can it really help a, a country? And would that be an umbrella law at the international level? How do you interpret I think the question? I, I'm assuming at the it's national, national level. Because at the national level, yes, I would say that, uh, and, and you mentioned the example of the United States, which of course was the first country to have commercial activities already in the 1960s with communications, uh, and developed really a pillar approach that uh, Amgard just explained, which now causes the problem that there is new activity, namely in orbit uh, or, or on celestial bodies, uh, use of resources, and there a little bit at a loss because which agency is going to deal with that? Is it the launch? Is it, an, is it the communication? Is it Earth observation? It's actually really none of them. And so they have to sort of find an ad hoc solution. So having uh, umbrella legislation that covers all activities uh, that a state wants to regulate, because that is a choice, eh? as you told also the scope of the law is a national uh, policy choice. Um, and I think that that is really what you see uh, since the, the most modern uh, space legislations, they are all uh, umbrella laws and so um, 
I think that that is the way to go, uh, and that can also then uh, develop the policies. I still think that policy would come before law. Uh, you first make some choices, what do I want to have and what do I not want to have, and then you translate those into a law to facilitate the activities. But I'm certainly a fan of umbrella laws. Thank you very much. Um, I will now wrap it up so we can get off to, to lunch. Um, I, I have really enjoyed this panel, so thank you very much, all of you, for your time and for coming here uh, to share your experiences. Uh, the one thing that I found in, my, in dipping my toes into policy and legal aspects of space is that uh, the, more you, the more you try and understand, the more questions arise. So, uh, so uh, and as many of us, uh, many of the pa panelists said, you know, we are in a very interesting, uh, I would say, policy legal uh, um, position right now with all of the emerging actors coming in, all of the new ideas that are being developed. Uh, and uh, policy and law is in a catch up mode to some extent. Um, and it's a very exciting time. So. Uh, Please uh, thank the panel for me, and uh, we'll uh, we'll pass on to uh, to uh, to lunch. Thank you very much, David, and all the panelists here. Thank you very much for this uh, really interesting panel. But I would still like to ask you to stay on stage because we still have one program point um, uh, before lunch, and this is our final keynote. Um, and I'm very happy to welcome on stage uh, Dr. Mohamed Alech Babi, the Director General of the UAE Space Agency. But he will speak to us now, not in this capacity, because since October last year, he has been assigned as um, an elected Vice President for Global Membership Development of the International Astronautical Federation. And in this capacity, he is also chairing our working group on new communities. And he will tell us a bit about the efforts to attract new members to the Federation. Thank you very much and welcome Dr. Alar Thank you for having me. Uh, hello, good afternoon. That's me again. But uh, I will speak to you to the, uh, today to you in a different capacity, but uh, I would like to take this opportunity because I might not get it to uh, thank and congratulate uh, IAF and uh, uh, the Royal Center of Remote Sensing uh, for the successful uh, organization of this event. Uh, it's uh, really, I was impressed uh, by the quality of uh, sessions, speakers, and also the management. Uh, the UAE, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, committed and also believe in uh, international cooperation, uh, cooperation on the local level, national, and also internationally. And as a result of this, we are happy uh, to engage and work closely with IAF. So as I mentioned today, I was uh, elected as a VB and last AAC in Bremen uh, for global membership and development. So I would like to pass a message for you uh, regarding IAF. Uh, IAF is a, is a great platform. Uh, enabler for uh, innovation and also uh, cooperation, especially for emerging uh, countries. IAF today uh, has more, has almost uh, 366 members uh, coming from uh, 68 uh, countries. Uh, this year, I think we will probably get uh, around 23 members, and I think by IAC in Washington, D.C., yeah, we hope to probably get two figures around, you know, 15 organizations. Um, so why uh, we should consider IAF? I can talk about our experience in UAE as an uh, emerging uh, uh, space nation. Uh, it's a platform for networking, uh, knowing the people, engage, uh, showcase, and I encourage every, uh, you know, uh, organization or uh, whether it's university, whether it's a company directly related to space or indirectly, but believe in space, uh, to think and join. I would like to see also, and I am committed to work closely with IAF management to increase the membership from the Middle East and Africa. And uh, we have plan and I hope that we will succeed, not to bring only benefits to IAF, but also to bring to the other side. 
IAF is a great platform, and I think for people who want to learn and engage and have space programs, uh, it's a great opportunity. Uh, our engagement with IAF is, uh, uh, is moving forward. Next year, we will host IAC in Dubai. This is also a great platform where we will have plan, where we will try to encourage more countries from the Middle East and Africa and even Southeast Asia. Uh, again, I try to uh, encourage you to think, uh, if you are not a member yet, or if you are representing an organization or a company or university, or to uh, engage uh, with my team, with IAF team, uh, and also we can provide you with the help, with the support. It's very easy, very st straightforward, and also the financial uh, obligation is minimal, but it's not that, it's investment. It's the benefits by being part of this uh, organization. Uh, so I will not uh, take more time because uh, it's lunch, but uh, uh, we will be more than happy to engage with you. And uh, I wish you all the success and uh, be in touch with you uh, because we are all trying to build the global space uh, sector. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for these uh, kind words um, and for all your support uh, you are giving to us, uh, to the Federation. Now it's really time for lunch. Uh, you are hungry. Um, I don't want to shorten your lunch time too much, but please try to be back at 2.45 when we will continue with uh, wrapping up this conference uh, with a results and recommendation session. So please. 2.45, try to be back here. Thank you. And once again, an applause to our great pen.